Thank you, Choir. Thank you, Wanda, for coming in. Uh, Craig, some plumber got a hold of your French horn. What's the name of that instrument? This instrument is a tenor horn. A tenor. It's just like French horn, except that it's in a different key. successful and has a 
has a large family and, and many goods and is respected and many friends. And so the forces of evil and the forces of good decide that we'll do a test. We'll just take everything away from this man. Everything he has, and see if he still is a believer. And things kind of unfold, and friends came around and wonder, what did you do wrong? Why did you lose all these things? And toward the end of the book, Job says, I wish that my words could be written down or chiseled into rock. I know that my Savior lives, and at the end He will stand on this earth. My flesh will be destroyed, yet from this body I will see God. Yes, I will see Him for myself, and I long for that moment. In all of His troubles, what He wants most of all is an encounter with the living God. He wants to have it out, face to face, with the one responsible for his place on earth. We think about Job's loss and his anguish and the almost utter humiliation that faces him. And suddenly he's childless and penniless and lost his wife's love. And he could begin to wonder if the universe is impersonal. Yet... He does not ask to be remembered. What he wants is his praise of God to survive. Faced with adversity in our own lives, and the end of our personhood, we can all turn into Job. We may approach religious life as it's about us, the survival of our world, our way to heaven, our souls in eternity. But Job has the nerve to imply that his Redeemer, the mighty God, the maker of heaven and earth, this breathtaking confidence is going to redeem him, which makes him much more than just a figure of pity. He becomes quite three-dimensional in this play or drama. When the poet John Keats, you had to read him in high school, um, when he was dying at a young age, he thought that nothing that he did would survive. Little of his poetry had been published, and uh, he was young, and he asked that his epitaph be, Here lies one whose name was writ in water. This was engraved on a stone that survives in a cemetery in Rome. His name does not appear on it, but he is widely known as the one laying there. A name writ in water. I had a secretary one time that said, you know, stick your finger in a glass of water and take it out and see how much difference you made. <laughs> you know, the story of the church that called the minister and they wanted a poor and humble minister and they prayed to God to if God will keep him humble uh, we'll keep him poor <laughs> just a reminder sometimes we feel like we don't really make much difference but there was another man just as obscure had his name written on hearts and minds everywhere and he is known as a, our redeemer jump to the New Testament. Do you remember a movie or a TV show called Seven Brides for Seven Brothers? That was back in the 60s or 70s, way back. Um, here's the story of one bride for seven brothers. One day Jesus was approached by a group in the temple and they were challenging Jesus' belief in an afterlife. And they said, well, here's the situation. Now, it is in our law that if a man dies and his widow is childless, it is the duty of his next oldest brother to 
to marry that woman so that she might bear a child and his legacy would continue. It's called liberate marriage. And so they said, okay, so here's a man that had seven brothers and he married the woman and then he died. So his next brother married her and then he died. And the next brother married her and he died. And the next brother, and so on, till all seven brothers have married her, she is, remains childless, and finally she dies. And the question we'd like to ask you, Jesus, is whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Jesus said, Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, he is God not of the dead, but of the living. For to him all of them are alive. It says in Exodus, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. Three of the patriarchs that had been long dead and buried and Jesus said, if God says, I am their God, then they must not be dead, but living. We all have different views of life after death. Some see it as a distraction from the work we need to be doing right here on this earth. It's been said about some people, they were so heavenly minded, they were no earthly good. Does heaven take away our responsibility to, to live and to do and to be and to be a follower of Jesus and a disciple in this life? It was not a new question that some people didn't believe in an afterlife. The Sadducees just represent a long tradition of people. They were the ones that asked that question of Jesus. They didn't see anything in the first five books of the Bible that was their Bible about an afterlife, and they thought the idea was kind of absurd. But Jesus believed in resurrection, and he responded in a very different way than the question that was intended to trick him. We think, well, there won't, is there no marriage in the afterlife? We won't want to lose that relationship his response was about there would be marrying in the afterlife because marrying in his day was about children. What I see in, in this story of Job and of Jesus is people who definitely believe that there was something more. Sometimes in our worst case scenario, we think, well, it's got to be it. You know, we're dead, we're dead, or even worse, we're dead and then punished forever. But you know, sometimes things turn out a lot more positive than we think they can. <laughs> Can't go wrong with this hand here. <laughs> Who would have thought it? The first game of the season, I said to Kathy, this team might have an offensive and beat Alabama. We hope that our worst case don't happen. We hope that there's possibilities. There's questions about this afterlife, you know, if if you're resurrected, is it is it the old you or is it the best you? What happens in an infant that dies? Does it does it have a chance to grow up? What about 
people whose personality changes as they get older? These are questions that are unanswerable. Other than believing in the absolute goodness of God, day by day we see wonders unfold, a universe that is so huge and complex, I just trust that God can figure all these things out. Yesterday at uh, Larry Bell's memorial service, I, I read a short paragraph by Charles Kingsley. He was a 19th century English cleric, uh, wrote several books and been quoted a lot. I thought he succinctly said some things I'll share with you today. Death is not death if it kills no part of us except that which hindered us from the perfect life. Death is not death if it raises us in a moment from darkness to light, from weakness to strength, from sinfulness to holiness. Death is not death if it perfects our faith by making it sight and lets us behold Him in which we have believed. Death is not death if it rids us of doubt and fear, sickness and disease, of sorrow and sadness. Death is not death if it gives us to those we loved and lost, from whom we lived, to whom we long to live again. Death is not death for Christ has conquered death for himself and for those who trust in him. It is through a relationship with Christ that we are able to say as the psalmist, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. There is no empirical evidence. Just knowing that the relationship of God can continue is enough. Because God holds on to what God loves. Worst case scenario, don't care. I think about the best case scenario. Let us pray. God, heal our minds from our doubts, our worries, our concerns that spiral us down into an emptiness and grief. Lift us up with your love. Remind us of your presence. Teach us to love you eternally as you love us. And be with us forever. Amen.